We may not be up there with rocket scientists and brain surgeons, but I think that most people assume that you need to be smart to be a software developer. It's not an unreasonable assumption. It certainly takes a certain kind of smarts to be good at this game. But what kind and why? If AI algorithms can translate instructions into code, and they can, then what is it about software development that makes it harder than this simple translation exercise and more valuable? What makes being a software developer difficult? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't already, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're helping us to grow our channel and their links are in the description below. If you're interested in the topics that I cover on this channel, then why not sign up for my mail list? where I publish how-to guides, talk about upcoming channel content, and periodically offer big discounts on training courses and books. Again, the link is in the description below. The simple answer is simple to this problem of what makes software difficult. It's other people. I think that there's some truth in that, but today I want to look at this from a slightly more technical perspective. I've said many times on this channel that I think that software development is about much more than only coding. But let's start with coding and explore why it is that that isn't really at the root of our difficulties. As I said in the introduction, modern AI systems like GPT-3 can take simple descriptions of a system and write code that works. We've been surprised by that. And while it's certainly impressive, I certainly thought, wow, the first time I saw the demos, on reflection, I don't think that it's really very surprising. GPT-3 was trained to process natural language, and impressive as it is as a technology, people thought it normal that it could respond to inputs in natural language, with outputs in natural language, but were seriously impressed when it could respond to natural language inputs with programming language outputs. Why? Natural language is orders of magnitude more complex and more expressive than any programming language. The grammar in programming languages is perfectly regular and consistent, unlike any natural language. I'm guessing that what really surprised us was that a computer could do something that we find difficult. We find programming hard because of the need for precision. When we are talking, we are constantly improvising, and certainly, if you are anything like me, often tripping over our words and accidentally misspeaking. This is pretty fundamental to how our brains work. The really clever part is in the listener. Despite me stumbling over words occasionally, mispronouncing them, or even saying the wrong words, you will still understand me. Your remarkable, fuzzy, pattern-matching brain holds some kind of model of the world, which means that you can correct my mistakes on the fly as I make them, with a fairly high probability that you'll guess correctly what I really meant. A computer is a lot less forgiving. In fact, it's not forgiving at all, unless we program it to be. There are many fewer right answers, a typo in the wrong place for a computer and our space rocket explodes. Human beings are not good at this kind of precision, but computers are. So fascinating as the ability of GPT-3 is to be able to translate an input like this into working code, it seems to me that the really clever part is in interpreting the instructions in the first place not generating the code as the output. In this case, the instructions are actually pretty simple. This description is really a kind of high-level pseudocode description of the system. These are the kind of requirements that I hate as a software developer. This leaves no room for problem solving. This is, the only, this is only a translation exercise. So impressive as GPT-3 is, this seems like a relatively simple exercise for it to me. This is realised in real projects by one of the real difficulties of software development. 
we tend to assume that it's some kind of mechanical production exercise, when in reality, it's an exercise in learning and discovery. In this example, the learning and the discovery, the hard part, happened before someone came up with that pseudocode list of requirements. We do that kind of thing in the real world all of the time. If you've ever had a user story that said something like, move the quantity edit box three pixels to the left, you know exactly what I mean. Let's think about this uh, from another uh, perspective. GPT-3 is fundamentally picking the next character of output based on probabilities. So if I'm speaking English and I write F-O, what comes next? Could be foggy, forgotten, foppish, forgery, any number of words. What if I was writing this in Java though? It could still be a lot of different things if it were a variable name. But if it was positioned in a way that we could tell that it was a language keyword, something that we expect a compiler to determine all of the time, then now it's fairly obviously that this is the start of the word for. It's the start of a for loop. So not only do we now know that the word is for, but we also know the kinds of things that come next. So we narrow our search space. This is a much simpler problem to solve for a programming language than it is for a natural language. So the simple translation of detailed steps into a functional program isn't what makes our job difficult. The real difficulty is understanding what those steps might be. We can't defer that to somebody else. I think that development teams that try to blame poor performance on poor requirements are usually looking in both the wrong and the right place at the same time. They're wrong in that this is not somebody else's job to tell you step by step what code to write. If you think that is your job, then GPT-3 can do a better, cheaper version of it. Even if the company that you work for is mistakenly structured that way, it's still not what our job really is. So if your product owners or managers are telling you where to put the buttons or which columns to add to your database, they're doing it wrong. This is an attempt at programming by remote control. The degree to which getting the requirements right is the right place to look is that figuring out what steps will take us in the direction we need to go and then figuring out if our direction was right is our job. Our job is solving problems with software, not coding. So we need to understand the problem that we need to solve and then try out ways to solve it. I wonder how GPT would do if we asked it to improve how we interacted with our photo collection instead of giving it a list of steps. Or fix this bug where the system crashes if I upload two photos at once. Or refactor the code so it's more readable and so easier to work on in future. These represent a different kind of problem solving. And one that at least for now only humans can do. These things are vague, unstructured, and sometimes subjective. Actually, I think that comparing how people think and work on code to how AIs like GPT-3 think and work on code has somewhat limited value. However smart they get, AIs are alien and work differently to us. So how we optimize to do good things will be different to how AIs optimize to do good things. For example, my bet is that each time you ask GPT-3 to write some code, it goes back to the start and rewrites everything from scratch. It's probably not yet great at data migration or refactoring. Humans don't work like that because we're too slow. We can solve much more difficult problems than GPT-3, but to do so, we need to work incrementally and evolve our understanding and our solutions as we learn more. Ours is a discipline of learning and discovery. What that means is that the incredibly difficult task before us, a task that GPT-3 doesn't face, is to sustain our ability to make changes as we continue to learn. It's easy to write throwaway code to solve simple problems. But if the code isn't disposable, or the problems aren't simple, at least to the degree that you need to revisit them occasionally, then the ability to make sustainable incremental progress seems to me at the heart of our discipline. And that is one of the things that makes it world-class difficult. This episode isn't about AI, it's about what makes it difficult to be a software developer.
So let's leave GPT-3 and focus more on the difficulties. The precision that our computers demand of us is challenging for us. We have developed all sorts of tools and techniques to try and manage that. Programming languages and paradigms constrain the variability of our solutions in different ways to help us express ideas precisely in a form that is both understandable to other people and also executable by a computer. Immutability, abstraction, type systems, functions, modularity, cohesion and so on are all tools to help us place limits on and exert control over the complexity at the heart of our systems and to allow us to build on what we have learned. This complexity takes three different forms. The first two are the accidental and essential complexity of our systems. The essential complexity of our systems that we build is inherent to the problem that we're solving. If we're writing a stock control system, its essential complexity is all about stock and how to control it. The accidental complexity is very different. This is the complexity that we add to the systems that we build because our software runs on a computer. The need to store things to disk because our RAM isn't persistent through power off. The need to render things on a display because we need to be able to see what we're doing. The need to take inputs from a mouse or trackpad or voice. All of these and many more um, are not really inherent to solving the problem before us, but that doesn't mean that they aren't important. Often the solution to these types of problems are pretty generic. And we've come up with generic solutions to, to many of them, like file and folder abstractions for storage or windows, buttons and list boxes for user interfaces. But they are clearly a different class of thing when compared to the essential complexity of our systems. In general, if our aim is to sustain our ability to learn and to evolve our systems to fit with what we've learned, then I think it's a good general advice to try and keep some separation between the parts of the code focused on the accidental complexity and the parts focused on the essential complexity. These things change at different rates. The rules of stock control don't change as often as whatever it is that look, we deem looks nice and modern in your user interface. There's a third form of difficulty though. And we don't often think about this explicitly, I think. It's even more fundamental though. That is the complexity inherent with dealing with information. My aim here isn't to get too hippie and esoteric, but information as an idea is a pretty fundamental concept. There are some takes in modern physics that see everything only in terms of information at the most fundamental of fundamental levels. Ideas like concurrency are not about computers, they are about information. Concurrency is the fact of two or more events or circumstances happening or existing at the same time. If we have information in two or more places and those pieces of information can change, they are concurrent. If the changes to them are related in any way at all, then uh, the level of complexity has just potentially exploded. This is a world-class quantum physics level kind of problem. And to bring this down to earth for a moment, we buy into this problem every time we spawn a new thread or decide to work on a branch in our code base. The degree to which this matters is primarily about timing. If I change my copy of some information and you are interested in it, then you're going to get a very different result depending on whether you look at my copy before, after, or during the course of me changing it. Now let's imagine that we each have a copy of the same information. Each of us changes it independently of the other. Which change is correct? Maybe they both are. Um, this is an incredibly difficult problem. At the level of software development process, this is the problem that version control, optimistic and pessimistic locking and continuous integration were invented to ameliorate. At the level of code, we use locks, synchronization blocks, immutability, transactions and eventual consistency. None of these things eliminate the problem though. 
and often they come at a significant cost in terms of complexity and speed. As soon as you have related concurrent information, the difficulty explodes. In some ways, this is the root of that other arch nemesis of software developer, coupling. If I write code on my own and keep it in my own repository, it can be as messy as I like. I may be dumb to work that way because I will suffer when I come to change it. So coupling matters to me a bit, but it's me that suffers if I get it wrong. Managing coupling in a larger system though, is one of the crucial tools to sustain our ability to make progress. This is because of concurrency. If I have a service that you consume, our services are coupled via the interface that we've agreed that they will communicate through, including any information that we share through those interfaces. One of the reasons that we might organize our work this way is to allow each of us to make progress a little more independently of the other, concurrently. But we are sharing information, so now we must incur the costs of that coupling. I either have to tell you each time I change my interface, and we must coordinate our work together so that the combined information of your system and mine are coherent, or I have to work to avoid concurrent change in the information that we share. But I'm never changing it. Concurrency and coupling deeply affect our work in small ways and big ways. Managing concurrency and coupling is one of the secrets of being able to sustain our ability to make progress, but it's always difficult. Thank you very much for watching.